Welcome to the sixth annual John Thompson Memorial Freedom Lecture Series. Uh, I am your moderator for the evening. My name is Richard Dauble. I am one of the directors for the Nassar Institute, and indeed my pleasure to welcome each of you as we get started on the series. Uh, we are particularly pleased this evening to have students at the university in attendance. But uh, to all of our guests, uh, it's great to see you, some returning faces and a few new faces, but hopefully you will receive enough this evening that you will become familiar faces next year and thereafter. I wanted to also touch bases on the fact that there are a few things that we have. There is firstly a pamphlet that gives a little bit of information about the NASA Institute. In addition, there are a couple of books that we have provided in the back. Uh, you, we'll talk a little bit more as we go through the evening of the purpose of the NASA Institute. But I wanted to touch right now on the fact that this is the Joan Thompson Memorial. Um, there is a bit of a write-up in the pamphlet about Joan Thompson, and while I did not personally know who I knew who she was, and I think it would be remiss of me not to at least mention what she was in relation to the NASA Institute. Uh, in addition to being the owner and found, the founder and owner of the brass and leather shop, uh, for persons who would recall, that is uh, one that used to be one of the leading, and still is one of the leading uh, end of year shopping. I certainly know my wife knows the place. Um, but she was also the founding president of the NASA Institute, a position she held very dearly and took very seriously because it promoted a lot of the ideals and principles and things that she was about. And she held that position until the time that she passed it along to Mr. Rick Lowe, who is currently our president and treasurer. Uh, Mr. Lowe is not here. Uh, he had a, a, a function that he had to attend. But he asked that I offer his apologies. But I think what we will do is instead of accepting Rick's apologies, we will instead offer our thanks. Because Rick has, Rick has been a, very involved in carrying us since uh, Joan has passed away and took along to him. I'm sure she would be very proud of the work that he has done during that tenure. Um, one of the things that is mentioned in the pamphlet, it talks about Joan's passion for economics and personal freedom. And more importantly, the want to share those ideals. Um, and that was very instrumental in the formation of the NASA Institute. And that was the purpose of us coming and putting on these type of lectures to share the ideas, to share the concepts, to hopefully enlighten persons to know that there is so much uh, that we at times miss. Um, and it's important that we, we start to look at these things if we want to develop our country. We need to develop minds and to develop our country. So that leads me into talking just a real briefly about the National Institute. Uh, it was founded in 1995. And in short, it's a think tank. It's, it's a think tank. Um, our objective is to promote capitalism and free markets. Uh, a little later, I will let uh, Peter, one of our directors, talk about the, the actual mission statement. But one of the things we want to do is encourage the revival of historical research, promoting the free and enterprising Commonwealth, and countering the political philosophy of statism in all forms. Uh, John Thompson is our president emeritus. Rick Law, as I said, is our president and treasurer. Uh, Peter Young, who's with us, retired, former high commissioner, and he's going to himself talk about something that's very near and dear to him. Uh, Leandre Spatis is also here. Thank you. Uh, George. Um, I think I lost Richard somewhere around here. He's also hiding somewhere. And, uh, the cost of the and Randy. Is in the back there somewhere. Um, where did Richard disappear to? So, there you go. So, again, thank you for being here. 
We invite you to sit back in it for merely for a few minutes, just expand your minds a little bit, open your minds, and hopefully get a peek into some of the things of entrepreneurship, the concept of free market, why, if only in our limited opinion, we think this is so fundamentally important to the development of our country. So with that said, I want to invite Mr. Peter Young to come up and I can say, talk about something that I think he finds very near and dear to his heart. And I'll let him introduce that to you. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a delight to, to be here to uh, just to have a few minutes to explain one particular project which the Nassau Institute uh, has been doing. Uh, Richard explained to you that uh, we're very active because we bring uh, speakers down mostly from the US uh, at, to the university to explain things in very much the spirit of what we believe in, which is free markets, uh, promoting uh, economic growth through free markets and free market uh, uh, society with limited government um, and in a society which embraces the rule of law and the uh, right of private property. That's basically what we believe in. And all our speakers speak along those lines. Uh, and I know one or two of you have been to, the, or to some of these lectures that we've had. But a few years ago, um, we thought, well, how do we, we're not trying to talk to people as it were out of turn, but we just want to expose people, if that's the right expression, to some of these ideas. And I personally believe in young people being able to know what these ideas are all about. And so working with the Ministry of Education I wouldn't dare do it myself, and anyway, they'd throw me out if I went to schools and, and said I wanted to do this, but working in harmony with the Ministry of Education, and I've enjoyed very much working with them. They've been wonderful uh, people. Don't listen to what people say about the problems of education here. You've got some very good people working in the department, I can tell you, I've been working with them. But we had the idea that we could start an essay competition. and. Because surely the purpose of education is to open younger minds to new ideas, new thoughts. Okay, you can go on the internet and you can research anything you like, but actually you don't. I mean, you might browse it, but you're not going to sort of look at the mission of the Nassau Institute and then say, oh, well, how am I going to link that up and go and search the internet? It doesn't really happen that way. So we have this idea. And we have a wonderful little book. Um, it's called Economics in... One lesson is written by a man called Henry Hazlitt, who was an American, uh, very well-known financial and economics journalist. In fact, he was billed as the world journalist of the 20th century. And he wrote this wonderful little book many years ago, even before I was around. It was 19, just after the war. Uh, it's been edited and changed a number of times and brought up to date. But basically, his message in that book is that economics doesn't change. The principles of economics stay. And they're all interconnected. The problems of economics and life and society is all interconnected. Um, and you can't just deal with one particular section of interest or whatever it is. It's all round. Economics is life, basically. And this little book, it's 24 chapters long, and it covers things like everything from profit and loss and um, uh, trade unions, inflation, uh, tariffs, non-tariff barriers, quantitative restrictions they call them, all those sorts of things uh, in a very readable form. And this guy writes very, very well in a, in a readily, what I think is a comprehensible way of learning about basic e economics. Because you can't specialize in economics and everybody of course knows that economics is specialized. If you put three economists, economists in a room and you give them the same data and the same problem, guess what? They come back with three different answers. So there are many, many complications uh, about economics. So this is what we did. So we, we bought, um, being eager beavers, we bought 500 copies of this book on Amazon and I've been dishing them out to schools uh, ever since. So we uh, do it for its senior high school level uh, anybody who's enrolled in the business studies programs, and there's quite a lot, both in the public sector 
and also in the private sector, the BAIWS, the Independent Secondary Schools. Uh, we give the book in advance to, the, to each um, of the students, and we ask them to read four chapters of this book. There are 24 chapters in this book, and they read four. And then we set a question, or should I say the department, I leave it to them, then sets a question based on the four chapters. And we go to Anatole Rogers, anybody know Anatole Rogers High School? Uh, Faith Avenue South, Cowpen Road, quite a lot of people haven't been down there, but I have a number of times. Uh, it's got a wonderful gymnasium, and it's my joy, we had our fourth annual competition on Thursday, last uh, 30th of January, and it was my joy to see 90 young people sitting uh, down there and given two hours, 500 words, uh, writing away. The attraction of this, of course, and this got round, is that we give very good prizes. I don't say that the National Institute pays for these prizes, it's the Templeton Religion Trust. And as people know, Templeton, Sir John Templeton, of course, who lived here for many years, has now passed away. But he left a lot of money for this sort of thing. And uh, so we get into that and we give some very nice cash prizes. We give cups, uh, trophies for all of each of the schools. And for the winner, we, we, we send them off to, to an economic seminar in Atlanta. Georgia, uh, under the auspices of the thing called Fee Foundation for Economic Education. And one of our people from St. Augustine, it was, Augustine, how do you pronounce it? Um, but anyway, he went two years ago and did so well there that the people told us that they really wanted Bahamians back. So uh, that's a, quite a, a carrot, I think, a three-day seminar, plus cash uh, and, um, and trophies. We also, because I believe very much in it, encouraging and incentivizing children, young people, uh, we give them a certificate, a name certificate, so we go through all that, so they can hang that on their walls and show their parents or whatever it is, but just for participating, because it's a bit of an ordeal and to sit there for two hours having read four chapters and then a question is suddenly thrown at you, uh, and they do, the standard I have to say is very high, my, my view, the top of the education tree here. Now, don't listen to these people who are all saying about people getting Fs. There's some very clever young people at these schools. Finally, we um, are now taking this a stage further, and we're going to, uh, as it were, teach the teachers. So, but the way we do it is not to tell them what they need. We ask them what they need. And we're doing that in a couple of weeks' time, gathering them together and say, is there any way we can help you in this? We can to get on to our for your teaching before we get to our next uh, essay competition next year. That's about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. You have been very modest, but I think that that program, when it was originally, originally conceived and launched, we never saw how far reaching that it could go. And now that we're into the fourth edition of it, I think that there's tremendous opportunity for us to touch the minds of young persons and in some regards, expose them to the more positive things that we'd like to see happen. And uh, by all means, if, there, if there's anything, we are very much open-minded to ideas and things that can accomplish uh, the growth and development. And so if there's something that you guys want to participate in or even toss at us as ideas to do, again, very open-minded and understanding our objectives to this. Um, so, I'm now going to invite Richard to come up, but he's going to do a very little interesting thing for us. Uh, I won't let the cat out the bag, but off to Richard. No, you haven't heard what I have to say. Okay, um, so Peter, I think, mentioned, or Richard mentioned, the uh, Templeton Foundation which is a uh, very generous sponsor with the NASA Institute. We very much appreciate their sponsorship. And so what they're asking of us is to uh, gauge a little bit of uh, the uh, effectiveness of the speakers that we bring in. And so I have a quick question uh, or two for you. And I would just like a show of hands uh, to gauge the responses. And then after the lecture, I would like to um, basically ask you the same questions to see if our esteemed speaker, uh, Professor Per Bunland, Byland, uh, has, has in any way influenced or, or changed your mind. And so at, at this moment in time, at this moment in time, if I could get a show of hands, how many people would say that 
Uh, the government of the Bahamas uh, is not regulating the economy enough, that there are not enough regulations to steer the economy in the, in the right direction, and that if the government um, instituted more regulations, the economy would be doing better. Nobody? So, the, so okay, so the government should do more to regulate the economy, and it would head more in the right direction. So is that, that's three? That's a low sum. Okay. Uh, and again, yes. Okay, so the government can do better in maybe uh, doing more to regulate the economy, not just in creating more regulations, but more effectively um, uh, executing the regulations that are already on the books. Would that change anybody's mind? Okay, how about this? Is the government doing just about the right amount of, of work in producing regulations for the economy? Okay. How many in here would say that the government should not regulate the economy as much as it is right now. That the economy would actually be doing better. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay. And uh, and then is there anybody who just doesn't know enough? You don't you don't know enough yet. Okay. And this one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Okay, again, the Templeton Trust Foundation is, is um, interested in, in whether or not the NASA Institute is bringing in effective speakers to better inform, possibly challenge, and maybe even change uh, people's minds. And so after the talk, I'll be asking uh, the same questions again. Um, our next speaker before our main uh, presenter is uh, Leandra Wilson. Is it Leandra? Oh, sorry. S. A. It's Bacchus, um, who will tell you a little bit about the award that we are presenting tonight. And what I did was I threw together a little presentation that will run in the background because I just happened to be in the business of my ocean and took some photos so that you can actually see what it is that uh, the business does that we want to honor tonight. Good evening, everyone. <coughs> I'm very pleased to uh, announce that our um, choice for the winner of the NASA Institute Freedom Award presentation is the young startup company, My Ocean. When I say young, I, I don't think it's that young. And the startup has been quite successful. We'll hear more about that from Mr. Eduardo Azevedo, who's one of the principals of the company with his wife, Tanya Clanaris Acevedo. The award is given for companies who have been started and are still run by their own owners, um, companies that provide an example, inspiration that are born out of a passion and interest in entrepreneurship. And I think this company exemplifies all of that and its product, which is beautiful, or its many products, which are beautiful, as you see on the screen here, um, show that what we can produce as Bahamians, the quality, the variety, and how our products can relate intimately to our environment. Products that are Bahamian, made by Bahamians, and for our local as well as our foreign market. You see, there's an attractive rate, a, a, a varied selection, and it's all handcrafted here in the Bahamas. Um, using local materials and local sources and local labor. We are, um, I think we can be extremely proud of this kind of business as showing a really high standard of excellence in our uh, local production. Um, I'm really pleased to invite Eduardo Acevedo up here to give a few, uh, a short talk on the uh, story of my ocean and also to introduce to us two of the principal productive members of the MyOcean team. Unfortunately, his wife, Tanya, uh, could not be with us, 
but Eduardo will share with us a bit of their experience as a young uh, company that has grown well. Thank you. ceramics, we make everything by hand, we, uh, we, um, uh, there's a lot of passion, a lot of love uh, uh, that goes into, into what we make. I would like, uh, I would love that uh, Tani would be here because she would be the one that really sharing with you the passion of the business, yeah? Uh, but I'm gonna, uh, we have been together, married now for almost 30 years, 13 years as well. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna share with you part of the story. I'm gonna to try to make it uh, short uh, and uh, nicely understandable. I would like to go back uh, actually to our grandparents. Our father was, uh, uh, our grandfather was Greek, or our grandparents were Greeks. And uh, our grandfather came uh, from Greece 1900, uh, 1947, just after the Second World War. And that was, um, uh, he came, he took the ship, uh, went to, to New York, he came down to Miami, he came to Nassau, and he started working. Uh, he, had, uh, he had the sixth grade, mm -hmm. he could not speak uh, a word of English, and uh, he started working in a restaurant. And uh, perhaps for the students in the room, uh, what do you think he was doing in a restaurant, not being able to speak the language? He was washing dishes, yeah. <laughs> and he, he came, uh, he left uh, Greece, he came to, his wife was pregnant. He came uh, by himself with the vision of uh, having a better life for, him, for himself and for his family. That was the vision that he had. He was working seven days a week, 30, 30 days a month, 365 days a year, and uh, washing dishes. And he did, that, he did that for several years until he had enough money to bring his wife and his daughter that he actually never saw uh, until to that point and to bring her to the Bahamas. He was able, after those seven years, and I think uh, um, he, with the, the love uh, that he got uh, from his family reunion, he was able to get, uh, he got a loan, he started his own uh, his restaurant, uh, he was able to, uh, after a while, to build the two floors on that restaurant that became what we know now as the Grand Central Hotel. And uh, so this is basically a successful story. What makes make him successful was uh, his uh, vision, he, the heart paired with uh, hard work and, uh, and uh, the the willingness to uh, to create something, the values, the values. That's a word, a word I was looking for. It was uh, and those values like the authenticity, honesty, and all the, the values that the, a good human being has. That's what uh, um, was passed on to his uh, to his daughter. It was passed on to uh, with, to his granddaughter as well. Uh, Tanya's parents, they didn't go to, to college either, but they were manufacturers. They, they, uh, they created, uh, with their hands, they created uh, uh, souvenirs too that they then later sold uh, on, uh, to, the, to offer to the, to the visitors in, in Nassau. And they were able, they, were, they too were hardworking people that really have the vision to make something new, to make something different. And uh, so it, they, they succeeded at what they were doing. And, but the passion that was uh, what drive them to the point that they're still doing it. So they are 70, 
two, uh, my grandfather is, uh, uh, my uh, father-in-law is 72, and they still making by hand conch shell jewelry that you can find on Bay Street and you can, you can, you can uh, admire. Those uh, Tanishi grew up uh, watching these things, living these values and understanding that the vision, the power of the vision and the values, they are important, paired with the passion, they are necessary in order to be successful. And uh, she, uh, she, uh, her parents, they understood to the power of, uh, of a college degree. So she went towards school and she um, uh, became, she was finished, she came back to Nassau and she, uh, as an artist, is kibitiology. Uh, so she uh, was working for her parents, basically making a, a basic salary, basically. And uh, for uh, several years, to the point that they said, I don't want to be working for my parents anymore. I need to think about something. And then uh, that's when she created uh, uh, the soap school, which is, uh, is a beautiful soap piece. And, uh, uh, the initial uh, soap scrolls, they were this long, and uh, so that's all that she was making, and she started doing it uh, in her kitchen. And uh, from, uh, from that, from one soap scroll, then uh, it started making uh, ceramic pieces, so that uh, the original thought was a soap dish, uh, candles, spa products. And what was inspiring her was just the fact that she would walk through downtown Bay Street and she would see all these products that were not made in the Bahamas. That they would not say much about what the Bahamas stands for. And she, her vision was really, let me, let me put something together here. Let me uh, create something that uh, people will take home and will have a memory of the Bahamas, that, that, that will reflect the sense, the colors of, uh, of the Bahamas. And uh, that's what, uh, what we do every day. We make people happy with what we, with, with what we create. Uh, the, different, uh, the five different lines that we have created, the, the bush line, the wild flamingo line, the blue hole line the shallows, uh, which celebrates the shallow waters of the Bahamas, and the summertime, all these fruits, the colors, and the happiness that we live in the Bahamas. It's summer every day in the Bahamas. And uh, so that's, that's what uh, 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 this vision will became a reality. We, uh, we, um, we, so from uh, one, uh, one spot in the kitchen where we're making everything, uh, where Tani was making her products, we are now we have uh, created a, a, a facility where we make, we manufacture our products in the Bahamas, on um, on Hawkins Hill, just next to the immigration building, and we we operate eight eight retail stores uh, in Nassau. We do face challenges when it comes to uh, uh, the manufacturing. It's a very a very demanding, a very um, uh, costly. Uh, it's very costly to make uh, our products here in Nassau, but the, the, the rewards, they are so, so big. And I, I really want to thank you again uh, for this, for this uh, award, which is uh, really acknowledging, recognizing what we have been doing. And all of these, uh, so the passion, the drive, uh, the values that we stand for, the people that are very important to, uh, for us, and uh, we, we, we are what we are because of the people that work with us, the team that we have. And we, have, we, have, we are now a team of 37 people and we are real like a family. There's, uh, yes, we've been going through a lot of things together, but we, we stand here and uh, we were able to work this, through these things together. We have a, an amazing team in place and I'm very proud uh, to be here. I'm very proud for Tanya and I'm so, yeah, very proud uh, for the whole team. And tonight I do have uh, two team members here. We have uh, uh, Natalie that has been working. She started working actually with uh, uh, Tanya in the kitchen uh, around 15 years ago. And uh, uh, basically Natalie is the, the, uh, the, the five star uh, salesperson. Um, and then we have uh, Wilmit. 
is just uh, holding my phone at the moment. <laughs> and uh, that has been working with us. Uh, we have been working out together for over 12 years as well. And it's, uh, for me personally, I'm proud to say that many of the, the, the team members that we have have been with us really for a long time. And uh, yeah, that makes me really proud. I think that's, that's everything that I wanted to share. Drive, passion, vision, and uh, a great team to make everything happen and uh, working. And uh, I know there's, there's 30, 30 students here, I believe. So for you all, I would like really to say, the future is in your hands. And uh, find that vision, find that passion, and just do it. Go and do it. Yeah. Thank you. So, I, 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 I'm not sure how to follow up on that. I love the closure, particularly to the young folks, the encouragement, the, the history, the story behind how it all started, where it's now at, and I hope that provides some inspiration. And please, take the story out. Don't keep it to yourself. I think sometimes Sharing is caring, I heard that term somewhere, but you will see that they are advertising the website, so for persons who may want, want to actually visit the website or even visit the physical location to do some shopping. I think that's also being advertised. I'd also like to recognize one of our prior recipients who is also in the room with us, Mr. Simonet, Michael Simonet. Uh, he has, I think this is maybe a year or two ago, as you were we encourage and hopefully in the near future can have more of these success stories shared in a more meaningful way so that this can become more than just one-off occasion. Maybe persons take these as part of their literature of inspiration as they go through life. Um, while everybody's getting into the food, I'd also want to point out that we do have some upcoming events. And of course, we invite you to participate Again, there are pamphlets, the back of the pamphlets, speak the boards, those that we have upcoming in March, we have Virgil Store, who will do a lecture on do markets corrupt our morale. <laughs> Interesting subject, I think uh, it would be good to hear that. And then in April, Max Goku, who will talk about cryptocurrency, something else that is, I wouldn't say trending anymore, I think it's a part of our landscape for the future now. And so it's something that we should all know about, spend some time investing our time and interest into. Uh, at this point, I want to... Oh, there you go. <laughs> Mr. Miller to come on up, and he's going to do an introduction for us, uh, the speaker. So, by all means, Jonathan, is it? Yes. No, thank you. I'm so used to this. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan Miller. I'm doing the introduction of the speaker. Our speaker this evening is Pierre Byland. Um, economists generally recognize that regulations have a dampering effect on economic growth. However, Dr. Byland argues that they vastly underestimate the real effect of regulations by failing to properly account for how regulations affect opportunities for entrepreneurship and consequently, how this lack of entrepreneurship affects people in their everyday lives. Dr. Balan will explore the extent of what we are missing as a result of often well-intended regulations with special attention to those opportunities for leading better, life, better lives that remain unrealized. Dr. Pierre Balan is an assistant professor of entrepreneurship and records, Johnson, Oh, and records, Johnson Professor of Free Enterprise in the School of Entrepreneurship at Oklahoma State University. Dr. Balin is Associate Editor of the Journal of Entrepreneurship and Public Policy on the Quarterly Journalism of Austrian Economics and a Fellow with the Mises Institute of Auburn, Alabama, an Associate Fellow of the Ratio Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. Dr. Balin is the author of Problem of Production, A New Theory of the Firm, and The Seen, The Unseen, and The Unrealized. 
oh, sorry, and the unrealized, how regulations affect our everyday lives. Dr. Bailin's research aims to explain the market process of prosperity creation and the economic development with a focus on organizations, institute, institutions, entrepreneurship, and management. Please, well, um, please assist me in welcoming Dr. Bailin. Thank you so much. That was a very kind introduction. Um, first of all, I want to thank the Nassau Institute for inviting me here to give this talk, um, and the Templeton Foundation for putting in the cash. It also helps. Uh, I'm also going to apologize a little bit because I will turn my back on you many times because that's the only way of shifting to the next slide. And I will start by put, actually turning on my slideshow because I will turn my back on you for. So, my talk is going to be on regulations, and just like uh, was mentioned in the introduction, I have a little bit of a different take. This does not mean that I um, take an opposed position compared to what Peter was talking about before, because economic law is economic law. And what we know about the economy, that does not actually change. As the principles are there and the principles are true and we know those principles, so I will not critique those. However, I will say that those will actually take us a couple of steps farther. So there's more to learn from those principles that we already know than people have generally recognized. Okay, so I'll take another step, so I will start by introducing you to a little bit to how we should view the economy, uh, what is actually going on around us, how to, how to see this from a, an economics principle or a point of view, and then I will take you to discussing regulations and why regulations are so much worse than most of you can even imagine. So that's where I'm going with this. So now you know sort of the, the final slides. But the rest of my talk will sort of be try to tell you why, explain why, and also I'll try to keep you awake while you're having a meal. Okay, so the economy overall, we talk about this a lot. And excuse me for being a little bit theoretical, but the economy itself, what the heck is it? We all say that we're part of the economy. Politicians say they want to subsidize the economy, they want the economy to grow. Well, what does that mean? If we grow ourselves, then it usually means that we have failed in our diet. That's not what we mean with the economy, because the economy should grow, right? The, sh the economy should get more and more obese, in a sense, right? But what does that actually mean? Well, the economy <coughs> is simply that we're economizing on all those means. So nature has provided us with a lot of different means that we can use to satisfy whatever ends that we find valuable. So there are fruits and berries, and there are beautiful sunsets, and all these other things, but they do not exist uh, in huge abundance. When an economist means, talks about abundance, it means that there's more than we can ever find use for. Now, what, what can we think of that we have in abundance? Except maybe bureaucrats. But who, <laughs> what do we have in abundance? Water. Not, not really anything. Well, water, okay, it's an island state. Maybe, yeah. maybe water, sea water, ocean water. <coughs> maybe, maybe that. But we can probably find some use for it too. And the problem is that there's so much we want to do. And there's so little to use in doing. That is the economy. Trying to figure out how to use all these things that are available to us in a different way so that we can get more out of it. That's the economy overall. And we all play a part, of course. But we engage in production, by which we mean that we make things and tools that are more uh, useful towards certain ends. Of course, going out in nature and picking rocks and sticks and so forth can probably satisfy some ends, but producing a machine is very different. Producing a machine makes us really productive and can allow us to produce things that are not available from what nature gives us uh, in natura. 
Okay? <clears throat> so production is anything we do in order to produce something that we can use to satisfy a want. It's producing those means, creating those means that take us to a better place where we can satisfy ends that we couldn't satisfy before. Okay? What we produce then are used in the process called consumption. Usually when we talk about consumption, we mean simply eating stuff, digesting it. When an economist talks about consumption, it means using something and getting value out of it. So the direct use of something. So from an economist's point of view, you are all consuming a meal, sure, but you're also consuming the fork and the plate. And maybe some of you are actually eating those, but <laughs> most of you are just consuming them as an economist would call it. You're using them and you're getting value out of it. You could also eat your meals without a fork and a plate, but I would not want to know you. <laughs> okay? So in the economy overall, we create prosperity one way or the other. And how the heck do we get to that point? Well, the very foundation of what makes a market economy is the transaction itself, the exchange between two parties. It's easy to, come to assume, as many have done throughout history, and many still do, that when you transact, when you buy something for a price, when you pay $20 to get something, it is worth $20. <coughs> and those are equal. Well, that doesn't create any wealth, and if they are actually equal, why the heck would you go through with it? Why would you exchange something that is of certain value for something that is of exactly the same value? It doesn't make any sense. You wouldn't do it. Why, why go through the hassle? So that's actually not true. It's not the case that because the price of something is $20, it's worth $20. What it means if you buy it is that it's worth more than the $20 you give up for. So in a sense, any exchange that happens voluntarily in the economy increases the size of the pie. It increases the satisfaction. It increases the value that in the economy overall. So in a sense, we would like people to exchange a whole lot over and over and over again. The more they exchange, the better, the better it is. It doesn't mean that we should exchange and then change back and then exchange a third time the same very, very items. That's not how we uh, make value and prosper. What we do want is that we get something that is of greater value for us, and the other person whom we exchange with gets something that is of greater value to them. And it can be easy, in, very easy in the sense that I am a baker and I have a hammer, and Rich is a carpenter and he has, he has dough or flour. Obviously, I as a baker would be more happy with flour and dough, and he would, as a carpenter would be more happy with a hammer, but it could be something else too. We don't have to ex exchange just because it's in our profession, be whatever that we value in that moment <coughs> that we like a little more. And in the exchange that we make, by definition, we want what we get more than what we give up. So think about that. Every time you go into a store, the reason you part with that money that you give the store owner, which is probably my ocean, <laughs> <laughs> you want what they're selling more than the money that they're getting. And they want the money more than the item that you're buying. Right? That, that is the very core part of what makes a market. very slow. Okay, so this doesn't really help though. So we can produce stuff, we can exchange stuff, but that's not the economy overall. That's like a very, very uh, rudimentary uh, kind of economy where not a whole lot happens. You can think of societies that are not very developed, that they still produce stuff and they exchange stuff. That's not where we're at today, right? So a core part of how we understand the market economy is the concept of specialization. By specializing, we get better at something and we also uh, get dependent on what other people are doing. So already, <coughs> excuse me, Adam Smith recognized in 1776, that's a long time ago, recognized that specialization and the division of labor, as he called it, is core to understanding the economy. Okay, so why is that poor? Why does that matter? Well, by specializing, first of all, you learn by doing. But you, you do something that is similar, you don't have to do everything yourself. You do something 
if you get better and better at it, then you can trade with others. And there we go with trading. And trading means that you get more value and the other party gets more value as well. But it saves time, right? If we all have to do everything ourselves, we have to shift from one task to the next. We have to pick up this other tool and put this other thing down. And suddenly something happens over here. We have to move over there to solve that problem. And then, oops, we have to take the, the, uh, uh, the bread out of the oven because it's done right now. And all of this takes a whole lot of time. That is a pure loss to us when we're working and we're trying to get as much as possible out of our time and our effort. And that's the economy, right? We're trying to economize on the inputs, on all those means that we have to get as much output as possible. So obviously, if we specialize, we can save on that time, we can get better over time, and we specialize a lot, and we have a process, and I do something that is pretty, I, I do pretty well, and then Rich does something similar, and we say, hey, I do the first half, and you do the second half, I just focus on this, then maybe, at some point, we're going to end up with tasks that are so simple that it's pretty easy to find a tool that can do it for us. Some kind of machine, some kind of simple tool, it's probably easier to produce a hammer to uh, hammer out nails than do it with your hands. And Smith has this uh, example of a boy whose task in a factory is to, when it, the furnace gets too hot, run up the stairs and close the vent. But no, open the vent, obviously. And when it gets too cold, he runs up again and closes the vent. That's his job. Pretty boring specialization, I would add, right? If that's your occupation, run up the stairs and open or close the vent. Most of us would not choose to do that, right? This little boy noticed that, hey, why don't I just tie a freaking string to the vent? Why would I run up and down the damn stairs. Well, today we would probably say, well, you should probably take the stairs instead of the elevator because you need the exercise. But he probably did not. Right? And he found out a way to make this a whole lot easier, a whole lot simpler, because it was a narrow task, because it was he was specialized in doing that thing, whereas all the others were doing other things. So by figuring this out, this small addition, he became a whole lot more productive. He just needed to pull the string every time it was time to, to open or close the vent instead of running up the stairs and all this stuff. Okay, so there's a lot to gain from specialization and collaborating with others in specialization as well. Well, Adam Smith, when he talks about specialization, he, he really talks about how 10 workmen can probably produce something like between 10 or 100 uh, pins in a day Whereas if they specialize in different tasks, they can produce something like 4,800 pins in a day. That's the difference between not specializing and specializing. Maybe 100, 4,800. That's a lot of value creation right there, right? Just in terms of output from division of labor. Now the trick here is that this is not even close to the actual power of specialization. Because what is, Adam Smith talk about in this example, he basically drags people in from the street. Because these are unskilled, uneducated, and un inexperienced workers that produce this outcome, going from ma maximum of 100 to 4,800 every day. What if, instead, we focused on something that we're good at, not just on something, right? So there's another economics concept for you, comparative advantage. <coughs> It's not competitive advantage, which is something completely different, but comparative advantage. Believe it or not, but we're all different. We're the same in some sense, but we're also all different. And we're differently able to do different things. Some people are really good at some things, I'm sure you know some of those, and some of us are really bad at other things, and you know some of us too. Right? And we're different in how good we are at different and we differ in the difference. Okay, there's a lot of different here, but... <coughs> but the point is, since we are different, even those who really suck at everything can contribute. What I mean by that is simply that if I'm really, really good at something, 
and I'm sort of good at the next thing, and we have someone else who really sucks. I'm going to use Rich as an example. He's the obvious one. <laughs> and he, he sucks at the first thing, and he sucks at the second thing, too. And the third and fourth. And yeah. yeah no, I didn't want to go there. But the thing is that the difference between the two things that he sucks at is smaller than the two things that I just excel at. Meaning that if I focus on what I'm really, really good at and do only that, and he focuses on what he is comparatively better at doing, even though he sucks overall, we're better off because total output still increases, which means there is a place for everyone in the economy. Right? Everyone is, relatively speaking, better than somebody else at something. I dare you to find someone who is not. That person doesn't exist. There is no such thing as an economy where we can just say, ah, you know, those people, they shouldn't contribute because we don't need them. No, because the economy is all about finding the means to satisfy our wants. And thus, if they can contribute, heck yeah, you should contribute. And the thing is that they do have a role to play and it, it comes comes out in the concept of comparative advantage. That they are better, relatively speaking, than everybody else at something, and they should do that. Because then they contribute more, output increases, we can satisfy more wants, they have a job, all of this stuff. Right? So there, there shouldn't be, in this sense, uh, any unemployment. Right? Because everybody can contribute value to everybody else. And through exchange, all those goods and services that we produce will find a home with someone who really, really cherishes that good or service. <coughs> okay, so lots of economics concepts here. This one is not really an economics concept. Though. So human ingenuity. I already talked about the boy with the string. Uh, we, we can sort of figure out that if I do this, this part, you do that part, we can, we can trade a little bit maybe. The thing is that we're always figuring out new things to do, new ways to do things, new materials to use. We're even innovating new materials that didn't exist before. Human ingenuity is core to the economy, right? And whoever does not have a brain, raise your hand. We all, we all have it, right? We're all ingenious. We all have solutions to different types of problems which means that we can contribute some idea that maybe we shouldn't do because we're not the best equipped to do it, but we can contribute to that knowledge and help others find a better place. And of course, with ingenuity, we have innovations. We have new technologies. We have new science that we can provide, and we've left them. So we let human ingenuity and comparative advantage and specialization and exchange work at the same time and let people pitch in wherever they feel like pitching in, where they find a role where they can pitch in. And the, the uh, result of this is our standard of living today. Everything that we can do, everything that we can afford, our comfy lives, our today very long lives, healthy lives, and so forth. That's what you get from putting these economics concepts together. So if we look at production the way it is today, it is highly specialized. Now, who, would, who do you think would survive in Mother Nature alone as an accountant? Even worse, professor. Now, I can educate the trees. I can try, but that doesn't help much. Most of what we do is completely worthless by itself. We are specialized to such a enormous degree that whatever we're doing is value created like egg. But we cannot live off of that if we were alone. So we all need each other, right? Comparative advantage, we're all following our dreams, we're all figuring out where to go, we're spending years and years and years and years and years in school learning stuff to try to figure out what we're good at, what we can do, what we cannot do, what we shouldn't do, and where we might find a place. 
We're innovating like crazy. We're disrupt disrupting the economy. We're creating new stuff that completely uh, replaces old stuff. Many of you might, well, some of you might remember the flip phone, how we used flip phones, and they got smaller and smaller and smaller. Innovation and research and development. Did you want to show everybody? Or? Some people in this room are old, so what you think. So, but it's not very long ago, it's 20 years ago. So those phones, when, when these businesses competed, were getting smaller and smaller and smaller. That was how they competed, right? Now if they would have continued, we would all be looking for our phones because they would be so damn small that we couldn't buy them. Well, there was this guy called Steve Jobs and he, he came out with the iPhone, the first one. Right? Basically what he said was, uh, a small flip phone, you can make it smaller, but what if it's a big ass phone instead? What if it's really, really big, but it can do other things? And it's probably a good thing that it could do other things, because if you remember the first iPhone, you couldn't really play the phone call off. Right? It wasn't a very good phone. But you could use it for the internet. A whole lot better than a, than a flip phone. You could use it to have all your music in your pocket. These things, right? It completely changed how everybody behaves in the economy. Where were th things like ride sharing or maps be today without having a small computer in your pocket? We would still be riding all over the world only taxis and we would have maps that we would unfold like this. We would have to uh, stop at the side of the road in order to unfold the map to figure out where the heck are we? And where the heck are we going? Is this a road? That sort of thing. Today, we just talk to the phone. We don't even turn it on. We just ask the phone, where am I? Where, where, where am I going? Tell me how to get there. So things changed quite a bit through innovation. And we have accumulated all this knowledge in what the economists call capital. So all these machines, these factories, and all these things, <coughs> all everything that we can use in production has accumulated over aeons, basically, but especially over the past couple of hundred years, when we have learned all, all of this stuff. Go back a couple of hundred years. See, what, what did people talk about? What did people use? Was it flip phones or smartphones? No. They barely used paper. Right? That's how far we've come through this. Right? So that's, that's the economy. Right? Which takes us back to the core of the market. These are the exchanges. Right? In production more than in consumption. Because when, usually when we think of consumption, when we think of exchanges, we think of us going to a store and buying things. But these exchanges are much more important in production. So it is between the business and its suppliers, between the business and its employees, and between the business and its accountant and all this stuff, right? And it's through the supply chain, it's through the knowledge accumulation that has happened for hundreds of years, all of these things, right? All of this is not planned by anyone, it's not directed by anyone, it just kind of works. Because you coordinate your actions with everybody else's actions. You buy from that supplier, but not that one. You buy if the price is this, but not that, and so forth. And everybody else sort of reacts to these things. Right? So the economy overall is exchanges, but these exchanges exist primarily in production. And that's where all the magic happens. That's where everything happens so that we can go to the store or go online and buy whatever it is that we fancy today. Still, though, as an economist, I have to go back to say that, well, there are really just two goals for all of us. So we either produce or we consume. <coughs> we produce in order to consume, and we consume to satisfy wants. That's, the, that's it. That's the whole economy, basically. That's how we explain the whole thing. Okay? It's also true that production always precedes consumption. 
this is no news to anyone, I think, right? That you have to produce something in order to consume it. That the chef has to actually put put the meal together before you eat it. It's pretty obvious stuff. It's not very obvious if you listen to politicians and their policy advisors. Because they think differently. They think that because we're consuming something, people are going to produce it. That's not how it works. You have to produce something and then people can consume it or not. That's the beauty and the problem of being an entrepreneur, right? That you produce something and then do consumers actually buy it or not? Steve Jobs did not know that people would just say, screw that flip phone when he introduced the iPhone. He was hoping, he was imagining, he trusted maybe that they would, but he didn't know. He couldn't know because the consumer would still choose, right? It's also the case that production facilitates consumption. And I don't mean that in the same sense as the previous sentence, that you have to produce it in order to consume it. You have to produce in order to get the means to consume it. And the reason you can go into a store and buy stuff is that you have income from somewhere else. That's how the economy works. It's a giving and taking. And you provide services over here so that you can then demand services over here. And you cannot ever demand services to a greater extent than you have already contributed value to others. Right? That's, that's the, the basic uh, fabric of the economy. So what we say then is that demand is constituted by supply. Because we produce things, because we promise to work, we get paid. Because we promise to deliver, we get paid, and thereby we can consume ourselves. If we didn't provide value to anybody else, we also cannot claim the product of anybody else. But the, when, we, when we do this, when we do produce and, and, and provide value to others, we can consume. So we serve ourselves by serving others. That's the basic uh, truth of this. <coughs> so we, what does this mean then? Well, many of you have probably been to a grocery store. And if you haven't, Cool experience, you can try it. Now, everything there is produced by thousands of people specialized to doing something very specific, only to have that good or good on the shelf so that you can pick it up if you want to. Right? Imagine if any product in any uh, aisle in a store was imagined, it was produced, someone invested in order to put all these inputs together, someone hired people to produce them, someone designed the freaking box. And then someone had to put it on a truck, someone had to drive the truck, someone had to put it on the shelf. All of these people are contributing value because just so that you can go through the store and then just, oh, I'll have this today. You don't think about it. By doing that, you just said, oh, you thousands and thousands of people who work to get this on the shelf, I approve. That's what you're basically saying, right? But you didn't pick anything over here, so basically you say, I don't need that today. What you did was not really right. Not for me. Which leads us to a core concept, consumer sovereignty. Every day when we buy and not buy stuff, we're choosing whether to buy or not buy stuff. <coughs> as consumers, we're sovereign. Right? So as producers, in order to get all the funds that we want to spend, we're really acting on the behalf of anybody else. We're hope everybody else, we're hoping that they will accept <coughs> what we're doing and pay us for it so that we can then consume. We're not gonna consume something just because it's there. We're going to choose to produce whatever, consume, sorry consume something that will enhance our lives, improve our lives, that will satisfy our own want. We choose every day. Every day we say basically that these guys did the right thing, these guys did not do the right thing, these guys, hey man, I approve. Or men and women and children and everybody, all those thousands of people, 
I approve of what you're doing. Here's my hard-earned cash. I'll just use the stuff. And that will move back in the chain and help cover the costs of everybody. Right? So in a sense, what we're doing then as consumers is maximizing right, all of those goods and services that are available to us for the hard-earned cash that we got when, when providing others with goods. We're using those in the best way possible from our own perspective. We're trying to satisfy our own wants, right? So very often we go into stores and we're not picking out stuff at all. Why? Because we don't think that that is worth it because we can uh, use our cash somewhere else. Because we can satisfy our wants in a better way. Or maybe if we save until tomorrow, we can buy something even greater. We're always maximizing. We always have wants. We have wants that are never be, will never be uh, satiated. We will never ever satisfy all of our wants. So at any moment in time, we're picking those ones that are dearest to us and satisfying those. Okay, so that sounds all, all nice and, and well, right? <coughs> That's the ideal. That's when everybody's involved, the whole economy is sort of free and everybody's happy and, and everybody's working as much as they like because if you work a little bit, you get a little cash, and if that's all you need, then you're not going to work more. If you want more cash, you'll work a little more, and we saw that there is a place for everyone in the economy, right? So is this some kind of utopia, then? Is this an ideal that is, that is not possible? Well, I would say that it is possible. You might disagree. It doesn't really matter, because we're not there. <coughs> we do not live in a free market a utopia, right? So, but what happens then if, if if we are not in this utopia. And this will take us to the issue of regulations in, in just a minute. Well, we can think of, for instance, destruction. How many here have ever dropped a glass and chatter? Okay, so you're all destroyers. <laughs> That's good to know. So I'll stay at this end of the room. But what you really did when that glass shattered was destroy the productivity of that glass. You no longer have that cup to pour water or wine or whatever in it. But you cannot use it anymore. It's a setback, right? So whatever one that you could satisfy with that glass, you might think, well, I have another glass. Sure, but then you have guests and you don't have that one glass necessary for that last guest. And that sucks. So there's still some want that you cannot satisfy because you've lost, you destroyed this piece of capital, as we would call it, right? <clears throat> well, what happens if you lose a glass? If you destroy a glass and you need that one glass? Well, you will go and buy a new glass, right? You will make this, make a different choice. You will say, okay, so I'll, I'll not do this other thing that I wanted to do before, I will buy the glass instead. Right, so you make, you change your mind because you, you value the glass so much. Had you had the glass, you would have done something else with your money. Since now you don't have the glass, you will use your money to get the glass. Because that's the most highest value and for you, right? So it's, it's a different situation where you value things a little bit differently. You've sort of updated your preferences, you might call it, right? Because when you had the glass, you didn't want another glass, why would you want another glass? When you destroyed it, well then, at the very top of your list, what you wanted to accomplish was get that glass, or get one glass, because right? you needed a glass. So you changed, the ch situation changed, and you still are aiming for that highest valued one, right? You're still maximizing, right? It's just that with the destroyed glass, you're at a lower level, and you change what you need to do in order to maximize, but you're still maximizing, right? No one is, is, is stopping you, right? So in that sense, it's a, it's a setback, but it's no, big, no biggie, hopefully. So this is a sort of famous uh, tale of the broken window. Uh, you might have heard other speakers, so you might hear in the future. If not, you should look it up online, because it's a beautiful story. But if you break your window, 
The story goes that if someone breaks a window, you have to replace it. That is business for someone else. Well, if that is the case, if that is the whole story, then why don't we just go out there and break all the windows? Why don't we go out there and burn down all the houses? Because then the construction work, workers will get a lot of jobs. Well, the problem is, of course, that if you're just destroying it, it's a setback. Right? Because you could use that effort to do something else of value. If you can keep that window or that building and still have your effort and your time and your money to spend on something else, you will be able to get a whole lot more out of the situation. Right? It's not that hard to understand, right? We've all done it. Well, most of us have done it anyway. So it's, it's no big This is different. This guy right here, he might not look all that intimidating, but he's a regulator, or he's supposed to be, right? With destruction, like I already mentioned, nothing really changes. It sets us back in terms of what the capital we have, but we're still maximizing, we're still going for what is the best possible for us in that situation. We're still exchanging with people freely and whatnot else, right? We're still going for that value. So yes, we're worse off because we happen to destroy that window or that class, but it's a temporary setback. It doesn't really change the situation because we can always get the best possible, the highest value possible. But my claim is that regulations are very different. They are not a temporary setback. They do not destroy something and then we just move on and we, everything is fine and dandy. Yes, we, we know the, the standard analysis. Uh, and Rich brought to my attention before that the Bahamas is the sixth uh, most expensive country to live in, live in in the world. Much of that is, I'm sure, due to regulations of different countries. Regulations increases costs and, and that's the standard analysis, right? It limits who, who does what, it limits competition, and therefore prices are higher, and costs are higher, and, and so forth. That's not what I'm claiming. What I'm claiming is that it's worse. So what is a regulation? Well, a regulation is nothing but a restriction imposed on someone or something. So you can't, by regulating, I'm, I'm talking about public policy, right? By regulating, it's not, you can't regulate that some people should get uh, wealthier. You can't regulate poverty away unless you make those people illegal. The only thing a regulator can do is limit what you are allowed to do. It's a prohibition, right? It's a, a restriction imposed on something. So you're hindering certain actions. And in some senses, it doesn't really make much of a difference. So, if you put a regulation in place saying that no one is allowed to fly without any flying machine and just fly themselves at a certain height, well, we can't fly. So it doesn't really matter. It doesn't affect us at all. It, it would hinder us if we could fly in that sense. But since we can't, it has no effect, really. But what if it does affect us? That's when regulations are really important. That's when regulations actually matter. And that's why regulations affect society, right? This imposes a cost on society overall because regulation is not a sim simple temporary setback as destruction is. <clears throat> it's a prohibition. It is basically just someone else, I mean, in this case, it's the government, but someone else saying that you cannot. That's what a regulation is. That's the core of it, right? It doesn't really change your preferences. Remember the, dis the discussion of, of the destruction, right? You still try to achieve the highest valued end. You're still maximizing. Well, if someone tells you, you can't do that, because then I'm gonna hit you or then I'm gonna put you in jail or whatever it is. That means you can't maximize anymore. That option is not okay anymore. 
It's not because you broke the glass and you're temporarily lower level, and then you maximize from where you are using your capital and your efforts and, and your abilities. It's something different. It's imposed upon you by someone else. <coughs> right? So we cannot maximize anymore. Many regulations might not affect us personally right now, right? So that might not be a big issue right now because we don't want to make those choices right now. But regulations are only effective if they actually affect our choices. And that is the point, right? Someone, or say the government, does not want us to do certain things for whatever reason. And because government says we should not do that, and they target something that we would have otherwise wanted to do, that's a problem, right? Because then we cannot maximize what we're doing. That's definitely a problem. <coughs> because our actions are restricted, right? we can no longer, we can think of us in sort of the utopian view before as thinking, oh, look at me, I have all this time on my hands, I have all this cash on my hands, I have all these tools, what should I choose? And then I have this imaginary list of things that I want to do. And then if there's destruction, oops, I lost the tool. Some of the options are off the table. Or I rearrange the options a little bit. Well, regulation is different. I have the tools, I have the time, I have the effort, I have the value scale, I have all, all those things on my list. And then someone says, not number two. You can't use not, do number two. That's, that's unlawful, that's illegal, that's prohibited. I tell you, you cannot. Well, that takes one of your maximizing options off the table. By definition, right? It doesn't make it impossible, no. Right? It just imposes a, a high cost on that type of behavior. That's why we have black markets. Some people, but some things are really valuable to some people. So even if they are prohibited, they would still choose to go for it. And they would pay a lot, which means they would buy it and someone else would make money off of selling it. Easy. So that's why we still have narcotics, for instance, for sale. Prohibited. Uh, punishable by many years in jail and, and whatever else, it's still available, but at a very high cost. Right? So it imposes a cost on the actor. I'm not saying you should all do narcotics. I'm saying that all regulations have this effect. They raise the cost quite a bit on certain options, only on those people who wanted to use those options. They can be very benevolent options. They don't have to be something that harms you, yourself. They can be something that you just want to produce something for someone else. Or you want a certain type of exchange with someone else. And you're both grown-ups and you both voluntarily want to exchange and someone else says, nope, you can't do that. Why not? Right? If you, someone else says, you know you cannot, that takes that option off the table, meaning you can no, no longer maximize that situation. Right. Okay, so with regulations then, what we have is that producers cannot produce or sell what they wanted to produce or sell before. Because they cannot make all those choices that they wanted to make otherwise. Maybe the highest valued action is gone. Or maybe the tenth highest that valued action is gone. It doesn't really matter. It risks the cost quite a bit or it takes it off the table. Consumers can buy and use stuff the way they wanted to before because they're not allowed. And entrepreneurs cannot create new types of solutions, new types of goods, new types of fancy uh, devices and what, whatever else because they can no longer choose certain options that they otherwise would have chosen. Okay? Which means if you're an entrepreneur, you will not have this, all those inputs you would otherwise have had. You cannot potentially use the production processes you would have wanted. You cannot produce the products you would have wanted. And maybe your products are not allowed to sell to consumers. 
There are a lot of knots there. Right? N-O-T, not K-N-O-T. You just cannot. Okay, so you cannot uh, pursue creating goods and services, not the ones that best satisfy consumer wants, because that's where you make your money, right? As an entrepreneur, how, how to satisfy consumers best is how you make most money. Well, with regulation, if you cannot do that, you have to do something else, which leaves you with less profit and the consumer with less value, which means a lower standard of your living. If you have those actions all along the chain that are no longer allowed, we have fewer uh, goods in our stores, a, a lower variety of goods in our stores. So maybe we have goods that simply cannot satisfy people's wants as well as they otherwise would. Which also means, of course, we have fewer jobs. We have fewer jobs because entrepreneurs cannot pursue these types of production that otherwise would have been the case. Okay, so my final slide, almost final slide. The real loss of regulation then is not simply that, yeah, there's higher costs and whatnot else. It isn't everything we can choose. Right? Remember when we talked about the economy and how everything fits together and there's a role for everyone and everybody's choosing their maximizing a course of action? Well, all of those things that we didn't get, all of those devices we never got, all of those technologies we never got, all of those ty types of food we never got, all of those whatever that we never got, that's the real cost of regulation. Not that the goods that are available today are a little more expensive, that's an effect too of regulations, but all of this stuff that we never got, all of this stuff that we would have gotten and probably would have chosen had it not been for English. But because we're restricting people's actions throughout all this production chain and in their consumptive behavior, in this interdependent sort of web that is the market economy, we have so many fewer options to choose from. That's the real loss, right? Because that's a loss of prosperity. Because you can no longer satisfy wants to the same extent. <coughs> you can no longer get jobs that pay as well as, as you would have, right? And it's a loss of freedom because all those choices are so much fewer, which means, yes, you exercise consumer sovereignty, but there's so much fewer goods, so much uh, less variety in goods. You would have been able to choose from a, a whole lot of different goods and services. We're not, so all the options, we're thinking today that we have so many options, and heck, being a Swede like myself, moving to the United States and trying to buy cereal, it's a whole freaking aisle of cereal. <laughs> I was used to like four or five counties, four or five aisles. We, we think of it in terms of all those choices we can make. Yeah, that's important. That's how wealthy we are, right? We can make all these choices. The problem is that we could have made choices from so many more different types of, of goods and services. And we could have been so much richer. All those unrealized <coughs> options that we never saw, we will never see, are not there for some reason. I'm not saying that we would live in the Garden of Eden were it not for regulations. What I'm saying is that without regulations, we would have so many more choices. We would have so many more different choices of goods and services, of careers, of types of businesses, of all of these of technologies, of all of these <coughs> different things. That's the real loss of regulations. All of that stuff that never happened. And you cannot measure that. You cannot see it. That's the problem, right? We don't know the real cost of regulation. We can measure the higher prices of certain goods. We don't know the value that the goods we never saw would have given us. And it's important to think of the, about that aspect of regulations. I think, especially how this fits with the whole web of 
interactions and exchanges throughout the economy, which is so complex like we started out talking about. And if we restrict everybody's choices just a little bit throughout this web, we restrict the outcome a lot. And that's a huge problem. And we need to think about that when we call for regulation. All right, thanks so much. So I hope everybody enjoyed their dinner as much as they enjoyed uh, Professor Violin's Four more. presentation. I know if I would have made it, it would have sucked a whole lot. I'm not good at a lot of things. Um, right now, the, the NASA Institute would like to offer a small token of, of appreciation uh, for the efforts of coming down here um, and pre presenting some material. I do believe this is part of a book called The Seen, the Unseen, and the Unrealized. And that would be the, the final slide. So um, that was a very much condensed ma material. So I actually have to leave because uh, my right is here. And so I'd like to fulfill my function. And I'm gonna ask this question in, in a, a slightly different way than I opened up with, right? Because the numbers were a little odd when, when we got them. It seems like there were quite a few people who were already on board with this idea that Maybe there's a too much, uh, too, too much government interference in the economy. Um, for those people, have your, have your um, ideas or beliefs been confirmed or substantiated with tonight's lecture that, yes, like, yeah, definitely there are problems when government regulates the economy? Okay? Okay. <coughs> Out of the people who said that it's not doing enough or it's just not affecting, effectively executing the laws, is there anybody whose minds were unchanged tonight? Like, okay, one. So, so you might have some questions. I would love to stick around for them, but I really do, I believe. <laughs> um, is there anybody else who, now, now you're just convinced that there actually does need to be more government regulation, that actually government regulation probably doesn't do anything that you heard tonight. It actually does a whole lot more good in society. Okay, so I know that's a little bit of a, a weird way to ask, but again, the numbers are kind of skewed when we were coming into this. Maybe you had a favorable audience already. Um, again, uh, I, I do appreciate you all coming out, especially my students, and I hope you enjoyed the dinner, and I hope you enjoyed the talk. I very much, along with the NASA Institute, appreciated my ocean, uh, the, 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 um, the award went to, I think, a deserving person, and um, I would just say, like to say adieu and good night, y'all. So before I call the cost up here to give the vote of thanks, uh, again, I have a very interesting uh, presentation. I think the last slide to me was the, the unmeasured laws that we sometimes don't take into account. So again, thank you very much. But I'll don't please don't, don't go too far. Thanks to the okay. Well, thanks. No, he's coming up with that. He's gonna want you to go. Okay. Well, do you want to do that? Do that? Do this yeah, and then go to the Mr. By Mr. Byron, Dr. Byron. It certainly was an interesting presentation. Personally, I'm still caught between um, regulations and less regulations because I believe that a lot of regulations are put there for our own protection. Like, don't put cancerous stuff in foods, <laughs> kind of thing. But the first part of your presentation was really excellent. For me, it, it opened up what the NASA Institute is about with um, um, the free economy and what the, what, um, the market and the economy is all about. It um, brought it into focus for me. And I'm sure that uh, with the students as well, um, you planted a lot of seeds there for them to have a better understanding of where they're going down this, the road of the economy. So the Nassau Institute is really pleased with your presentation. I'm very proud to present you this book on gateways to the new world. So, thank you very much.
So before we do the formal board of thanks, uh, just a couple of things. Are, will we have the presentation available? Uh, perhaps is that allowable that we can sure. share sure. to the website so that persons can still have use of it? Um, I think Peter talked about this book, Economics in One Lesson. Uh, there are copies in the back there. Please avail yourselves of it. But more importantly, and something, there's a, also a booklet back there called The Learning Crisis. It was published in 2009. Read it. it was, it's very interesting in the context of where we are some 11 odd years later. Just grab a copy of it, and by all means, share it, study it. We'd be more than happy to hear your comments. So that's hopefully the last you heard of me. My ride's not here. I'm just going to go and sit down. <laughs> and I'll tell you what it's the cost of the photo Thank you. And I guess I have the, the easiest task. The easiest task for, for this evening, um, the vote of thanks. And I'd, I'd really like to begin by, by um, complimenting the NASA Institute for what it does. But there's the saying that um, we sit in the shade of, of trees that we did not plant, and we will plant the seeds of trees that, um, under which we will not, not sit in the shade. And I, I see very much that um, that is what the NASA Institute does. It plants seeds and that uh, we may not realize. And we're really grateful for the students that are here and the members of the general community that is here uh, because the NASA Institute does bring alternative means of thinking about how we can positively affect our economy. Um, the moderator, Richard. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you've done this, I think, two or three times before, and you know, being a successful business person, you really could have had a, a second career in being an MC or a, a moderator or a, for hosting events. You are smooth, and we are grateful for your engaging comments in between the various elements. So thank you very much. Mr. Peter Young, the retired British High Commissioner to the Bahamas. But you're not really retired because you are very active in so very many other ways. Um, certainly, your contribution to the NASA Institute, um, your contribution with regards to how you have engaged um, all of these students with your essay competition and the Ministry of uh, Education and now you're taking it to another level with um, training the teachers on how best to engage these students. It speaks very much to your, your active lifestyle and um, you are an example for many of us. And so we thank you very much for your contribution. <laughs> Leandro, the presentation of the award, you know, Again, the NASA Institute, we're always, number one, you're charming. <laughs> and we're always, always also we're always very grateful for the insight that you have to our various issues that we, we um, face from time to time. A lot of times you do it by email or, or um, in the chat group. But you always have a, a really invaluable contribution to make to uh, the Institute. And we're grateful to, uh, to you for that. And we also thank you very much for being a part of the selection process of the MyOcean uh, company. And uh, so thank you very much. Sure. <laughs> Eduardo. You know, I, I didn't know of MyOcean um, until it, it was discussed with the NASA Institute um, that um, my ocean was deserving of this award. And the first thing that I saw was the website. And as I intimated to you earlier, it's really so tastefully done. And your products are absolutely beautiful. And you commented about having products that, that typified the Bahamas. And your website and your choice of products, they do that so extraordinarily well. It's something that every Bahamian would be really very proud to say yes. You know, they, we can all identify with what, how you present 
your products and the country. So congratulations on the award. It is truly deserved. And thank you very much for presenting the Bahamas in such a wonderful way. And your passion, that story with your, your, your grandparents and the values and the enthusiasm, brilliant. It's an example for, for us all as well. Thank you. Richard is, uh, Richard is gone, his ride is okay. But um, Richard, as a director of the Nassau Institute, I think what, what strikes me most about Richard is his enthusiasm. His enthusiasm for the surveys in particular, but, but, but also, he's also looking for a different angle on how he can get us to approach um, an, an issue from another perspective. And um, I guess that's why he's so enthusiastic about having these surveys so that they can give him a better feel as to where we all are and um, give him some further insight onto how we can best address the issue of presenting, of presenting to his students um, better ways or more effective ways of addressing the issues that are present in our market the free economy, how we can now better be more effective at diversifying our economy, how we can be more effective at freeing up our economy. And um, so for that, we're grateful to, to Richard and his uh, efforts tonight. Jonathan Miller in the presentation to the speaker. Before the evening began, I, I spoke briefly with uh, Jonathan, and he was really nervous. You know, but I had to say to him that uh, he naturally speaks clearly and slowly, and um, that's really what we all want uh, in, in um, any presentation. It, it has to be clear, you have to not speak too quickly, and you have to project your voice. So Jonathan, well done. And finally, choices. Um, you know, I think that uh, I really enjoyed, enjoyed the meal. Um, the service was almost silent. Um, the staff, they went about what they had to do almost invisibly. And um, the choice of the, the, the selection of the, the meal was brilliant. Um, so I think that um, the future, this place being a culinary center um, for tourism in the Bahamas going forward, I think that we are in safe hands with um, if, if this is uh, the sort of uh, production and um, choice of personnel that uh, will be in our, our tourism industry going forward. So choices, thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, that does it for me. I trust that the evening was enjoyable. And um, please listen out for the NASA Institute. Please visit our website. And um, on your brochure, there are a number of um, future presentations that will be made. And uh, we ask you to please um, attend to them with, uh, with whenever you can. Thank you. You know, that was at the beginning when I, I spoke about the Nassau Institute, but the Nassau Institute would not be what it is, were it not firstly for Joan Thompson, but, and, and there is a, a, a and that is why this uh, Memorial Freedom Lecture uh, is, is dedicated to her. But we have a president in the person of Richard Super Rick Love, everybody used to call Super Rick. And you know, I, I thought the other day perhaps I should call him Farmer Rick because he is so enthusiastic with the Nassau Institute. Um, his passion 
kind of let go even from a loser. And when I was speaking about the seeds of the, that would be planted um, and the trees that uh, we will not sit in the shade of, when I first thought of, of um, that phrase, I thought of Rick. Because Rick almost is the Nassau Institute. His enthusiasm, his passion, um, he, hold, he is the glue that holds us all together. Uh, and, and we are forever indebted to him. And so I really, in, in absent here, I would like for you to please give him a, a rousing round of applause.